I know that many of you give when you're at church. Uh, please continue to give to the church even while you might be unable to attend. Being a small church, that's a very small amount, but it's necessary to afford rent, uh, utilities, to be able to broadcast as we do. You can give online at calvarybirmingham.com. When you're there, just click on Give. You all know that we've never passed a plate. Uh, I don't talk about giving to the church except, you know, when it comes up uh, in the text of the Bible. Most other churches put a, a lot of effort into making money so they can support a large staff. Uh, their pastors write books, they hold conferences, they make movies, they push their congregations to give more and more with promises of God showing favor to those who give. We have only talked about money when it comes into the text of the Bible, when it works with the text that we are in. I don't push books, I, I don't come up with conferences, and I don't make promises of God multiplying gifts back to the giver. People who are guilted into it, or who are made to think that their giving somehow commends them to God, that is, people who are manipulated, do tend to give more. But we don't do that. So we don't have a large amount of savings that we can draw from. And in these extraordinary times, I find myself in the position of desperately needing to ask. I don't ask you to give sacrificially unless the Lord moves you to do that. I just ask that you consider giving so that we can continue. Without being here, uh, at the church, there are several ways you can give. Uh, you can give by mail, either set up automatic contributions through your bank or, or a bill pay service, or you can mail it directly here. Our address is Calvary Chapel, Birmingham, 1738 Morgan Park Road, Birmingham, Alabama, 35124. Checks can be made out to Calvary Chapel, Birmingham. Or you can give online. Go to calvarybirmingham.com. In the menu at the top of the page, click on Giving, and it will take you to a page where you can set up a one-time gift or you can commit to a scheduled gift. Please, my friend, please pray about giving into this ministry so that we can continue to faithfully teach God's Word as we have always done. The world is spinning and I'm dizzy staring at the stars the pages in my schedule, but they're falling hard. Find me on your way out, I'll be right here. The world is spinning and I'm dizzy staring at the stars. They don't seem so far. The sky is sunny, but the clouds are running in my head. part instead Don't know what to say now I'll get my eyesight checked In chapter 3, we were introduced to John the Baptist and his ministry of calling for repentance and baptism. The physical act of being ceremonially immersed in water was not something that was new. It had been practiced for centuries. There were deep pools at the temple called mikvahut, which means collection of water. These were used for ceremonially cleansing before entering the temple grounds. The idea was that spiritual purification and cleansing before coming into contact with that which was holy. But the baptism of John was not something that happened at the temple. It was in the wilderness at the Jordan River, near where Israel would first have crossed over into the promised land. 
This was an unsanctioned baptism and quite different from the ceremonial immersion of the mikvah. This was also not the baptism that Christians would later practice after the earthly ministry of Christ. Now, there was another type of cleansing also practiced by the Jews and also sanctioned by the religious leaders. This was the ritual cleansing of Gentiles who desired to become converts to Judaism. But the baptism that was practiced by John the Baptist was not sanctioned by the Jewish religious authorities. It was directed toward his fellow Jews, and the purpose of it was repentance. You see, it was not only the Gentiles who needed to repent. And that was John's message. He was preparing the way for Jesus by preparing the hearts of Israel. Baptism today also symbolizes, <coughs> and I want to emphasize that word, symbolizes repentance as well as cleansing. But Jesus has given it a new emphasis Christian baptism is a mark of one's identification with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. It represents a cleansing that is complete. It represents commitment that is the natural response of someone who has been made new. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross completely washes away our sins. And we are raised to new life, empowered by the Holy Spirit. With John's baptism, a person repented of sin and was therefore ready to place his faith in Jesus Christ. John's baptism foreshadowed what Jesus would accomplish, much as the Old Testament sacrificial system did. And in chapter 3, Jesus came to John to be baptized, demonstrating that he approved of John's ministry, but also allowing John to fulfill his ministry by pointing to Christ as the Lamb of God. Now, after Jesus came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then chapter four continued the action from chapter three is Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, last Sunday, we studied through the first part of chapter four. Jews were by and large expecting the Messiah to be a conquering king, not to come on the scene and then disappear into the Judean wilderness. But Jesus went up to the wilderness where he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights while being tempted by the devil. Now the text of the gospels records three specific temptations that Jesus faced. In all three cases, he overcame the devil's temptations. The conquering king expected by Israel would overthrow Rome and establish Israel as the great kingdom. In his first incarnation, Jesus was not militaristic in his power or even political in his power, but his authority and power were staggering nonetheless. Facing Satan as a man without relying on his divine nature, Jesus was yet powerful enough to conquer the devil and his gospel powerful enough to usher in Jews and Gentiles alike. We finished out last week with Jesus having successfully defeated the devil's temptations. And we need to fill in some gaps before we move on to the second part of the chapter. At this point, John the Baptist had been arrested and imprisoned by Herod the king. This was King Herod the Great's son, who ruled the region of Galilee between 4 BC and 39 AD. Herod Antipas lusted after his brother's wife, Herodias. Now Herod persuaded her to divorce her husband and to marry him. John the Baptist denounced the marriage as being unlawful, making Herodias furious at him. Later in Matthew 14, we will read this. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had said to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. Now, we don't know how much time passed between verse 11 and verse 12 of Matthew 4. But it is generally accepted that Jesus' ministry lasted for three years. And the synoptic gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, do not fully cover that first year. The gospel of John gives us insight into the first year of Jesus' ministry up to chapter 4. So we aren't left in the dark about it, but we hear nothing in Matthew 
about the, that first year between Jesus' baptism by John and, and, and John's arrest. Now, where we pick up this morning, a lot of time has passed. And we'll see that Jesus has heard that John is in prison. John was imprisoned in the dungeons of the fortress Mechorus. Now, Mechorus is one of the fortified royal palaces often, most often associated with Herod the Great. It was located on the east side of the Dead Sea and was one of seven fortresses, but the only one that was on the east side of the Jordan. From its high setting, Jerusalem was visible in the distance as well as the other fortresses. In 1968, an excavation was conducted by Jerry Vardaman, who later founded the Cobb Institute of Archaeology at Mississippi State University, by the way, where I studied in the 90s. Now, the report he wrote came a year after the Six-Day War in June of 1967 and described Macarus as an important site in Judea. Further excavations have revealed the site to be the fortress of Macarus and have allowed some understanding of how the place was laid out. John the Baptist's imprisonment would ultimately lead to his death, but we'll get to the rest of that story later in chapter 14. More important to our text for today was the fact that at the time that John the Baptist was imprisoned, Jesus left Nazareth for Galilee. For Jesus, it was time for him to go out to the area where much of his ministry would take place. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. This is where we pick up for today with verse 12. But first, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this brand new morning, the breath that you've placed in our lungs for each new beat of our hearts. Lord, you are truly the living God. You are compassionate and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And we ask as we enter into this study of your written word that you would give us wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so starting with verse 12 of Matthew 4, we read this. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region, in shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So at the time that John the Baptist was imprisoned, Jesus left Nazareth and he took up residence in the town of Capernaum. Was it that Jesus was afraid of Herod? Well, of course not. All all you have to do is look at his willingness to confront powerful leaders as recorded in the Gospels to know that it would be silly to suggest that Jesus was afraid of anyone. And by the way, moving to Galilee was not exactly escaping from Herod. Nazareth was located in Lower Galilee and Capernaum was located by the Sea of Galilee, still within the region of Herod's rule. So by no means was this a moving away from Herod. But this move is not meaningless. There was some symbolic finality in the move. You see, Jesus was leaving his hometown. He would come back But he wasn't going to come back to live. In fact, he would come back to be rejected. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the timeline of his first year of ministry is a bit difficult. And the synoptic gospels really don't make it very clear. His public ministry began with his baptism by John the Baptist. Jesus then went off into the wilderness to fast and endure temptation from the devil Sometime after that, Jesus calls his first disciples as recorded in the Gospel of John. That was Andrew, Peter, Philip, and Nathaniel. Now also during this time is when in the Gospel of John, Jesus turns water into wine at the wedding in Cana, which was just a bit north of Nazareth. From here, Jesus spent a few days in Capernaum before heading to Jerusalem for Passover. The Gospel of John then has Jesus in Jerusalem, clearing the temple for the first time. 
And John also records that Jesus had an important talk with Nicodemus. Jesus' ministry began to grow, and he and his disciples began to baptize in Judea. And at some point in this, Jesus announced his ministry using a prophecy of Isaiah at a synagogue in Nazareth. Now, it's around this time that John the Baptist is arrested and imprisoned, and Jesus leaves Judea for Capernaum in Galilee. So Jesus has already called Andrew and Peter, and we'll get to see how we see them being, uh, well, we'll get to how we see them being called by Jesus a second time later in this chapter. Galilee was the most northerly district west of the Jordan River. It did not reach the Mediterranean coast to the west, as that was owned by the Phoenicians. Now, in the northeast, its boundary was Syria, and to the east, its border was the Sea of Galilee. Herod Antipas ruled over more territory than that. There was more to his kingdom in the south and on the east side of the Jordan River and Dead Sea. Now, the region of Galilee was not incredibly large. It was 50 miles from north to south, 25 miles from east to west. However, Galilee was highly populated as it was the most fertile region of Israel. Josephus recorded that in Galilee, there were 204 small cities, and none of them had a population of less than 15,000 people. So Jesus took his ministry to an area of Israel that was the most highly populated, where the most people would hear him. Josephus also records that the Galileans of all the people of Israel were open to new ideas. The name Galilee comes from a Hebrew word that means a circle. And the full name of the area was Galilee of the Gentiles. And the reason it was called this was that Galilee was surrounded by Gentiles. Phoenicians to the west, Syrians to the north, to the south, an area of Samaritans, and just on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, the highly Gentile area of Decapolis. So there were many non-Jewish influences and different ideas being communicated in and around Galilee. Also, many of the great trade routes and military roads went through Galilee. This brought a lot of foreign trade and foreign influence to the area. Originally, the the region of Galilee had been assigned to the tribes of Asher, Naphtali, and Zebulun back in Joshua chapter 9. But those tribes never completely drove out, <coughs> excuse me, drove out the Canaanites that were there. And so the population of Galilee was a mixed one. From the 8th until the 2nd century BC, the, the Galilee had been controlled by Gentiles. When the Jews returned from Babylon, Babylonian exile under Nehemiah and Ezra, many of the Galileans came south to live in Jerusalem. In 164 BC, Simon Maccabeus chased the Syrians north from Galilee back to their own territory. And when he came back, he took with him to Jerusalem the remnants of the Galileans that were left. So it was nearly entirely Gentile for a long time. But in 104 BC, uh, Aristobulus, a Hasmonean king of Judea, reconquered Galilee for the Jewish nation. He then proceeded forcibly to convert the inhabitants of Galilee and thus to make them Jews, whether they liked it or not. And it was here, in the very mixed region of Galilee, that Jesus began his mission. Jesus went from Judea, where he and his disciples were baptizing, north to Upper Galilee in the city of Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is no longer an active city, but its partially excavated remains are an archaeological park. Matthew often went back to the Old Testament and found prophecies which line up with Jesus' life. And here in verse 15, he quotes a passage from Isaiah 9 that dates back to the reign of Pekah over the northern kingdom of Israel. Matthew 4.15, again it reads, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way, the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region... In shadow of death, light has dawned. Now in those days, the northern parts of Israel, including Galilee, had been invaded by the armies of the Assyrians. 
And so this was originally a prophecy of the deliverance which would one day come to those conquered territories. But Matthew finds in the text a prophecy which foretold of the light that Jesus was to bring to these people who were plunged into the darkness of apostasy and sin. The light of Jesus and the gospel that he brings has now come. Now let's reread verse 17 since we've spent so much time in the other verses here. Verse 17 said, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Matthew gives us a brief one-sentence summary of the message that Jesus brought. And let's start with Jesus began to preach. Many people have differing ideas of what preaching is, and if it doesn't match up with what they're looking for, then they consider it to be not valid. But the Greek word for preach here, keruso, uh, means proclaim, and it speaks of the proclamation of a herald. It has nothing to do with appearance or style. It has everything to do with the giving of a message. It was often used of a message coming directly from the king. Now, there are some things that should be recognized about the message that Jesus brings. First of all, it is from God the Father. To the crowd who were present later at Jesus' triumphal entry, Jesus said in John 12, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command that I should say and what I should speak, or what I should say and what I should speak. Now, secondly, notice the certainty of the message. There is no, no words like perhaps, no words like maybe. There's, there's no doubt in there. That is because what Jesus said came from his Father God. This is why it's important that preaching and teaching come from God's word and not from what we feel or from impressions we might have or even from life experience or what we think we may have heard God say. Third, the message carries authority because it comes from the king. When God's word is preached faithfully, it is straight from God's written word, meaning it is directed from the Lord himself. There is no call for doubt. There's no call for uncertain, uncertainty. And it carries authority that is, that is not the authority of the herald, but is all the authority of the Lord. The message of Jesus consisted of a command, which was the consequence of a new situation. Jesus said, repent. It's the Greek word metnoio, metnoio, used throughout the New Testament to mean a change of mind about God, resulting in a turn from your own ways and a turn to God. The result, of, uh, the result is a reverse in direction. You're no longer walking away from God, but walking instead toward God. That command had become urgently necessary because God's plan of salvation was about to come to pass. Now consider these words that the Gospel of John records from Jesus. John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Jesus would soon give his life for the sheep. Later in John 10, Jesus said, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. Now, I mentioned earlier that Jesus went up briefly to Nazareth and spoke in a synagogue. But I didn't say what had happened there. What happened there seems to have proceeded from, uh, it seems to have preceded what we are studying here in Matthew, but gives us further understanding of, of these events. So let's, let's take it into consideration here. We find the events in Nazareth recorded in Luke 4. You may want to turn there. Let's, let's read that now, starting with verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book 
and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, You you will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows here, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent, except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. What incited this crowd? Was it what Jesus said in the synagogue? Nazareth is is much larger now, but in that time it was a smaller town. Why would they have been upset by what Jesus read. They would have all known him. Well, consider that they knew him as he was growing up, maybe even had him repair their house or or help them out on some project. He would have been at synagogue with them, as well as celebrations and, and other events. And this time in the synagogue, it was his turn to read And given all that he had been doing and preaching, there was no doubt about it. Jesus was saying that he was the Messiah. Now, at this point in the ministry of Jesus, he has already done miracles unrecorded by Luke, but recorded in the first four chapters of John. So there was probably some anticipation about Jesus's reading. What would he read? What would he say? But more than that, what sign would he give them? Jesus predicted that they would ask for a sign when he said, you will surely say this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. And then he predicted their rejection of him, using Elijah's and Elisha's miracles for examples. In verses 25 through 27 of Luke 4, Jesus speaks of Elijah being received by and and ministering to Zarephath and Elisha healing Naaman. Both were Gentiles. What Jesus was inferring was what was about to happen. His own people were about to reject him and ultimately he would be better received by the Gentiles. He was pointing this out to them, giving them the opportunity to decide otherwise. Now in our text of Matthew 4, he's moved on to Galilee, where the Gentile population was high. But then, does this mean that his ministry shifted to the Gentiles? Well, no, not at all. Let's take a look at the following scenario in Matthew 15. Starting verse 21, then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. 
But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Jesus departed from there, skirted the Sea of Galilee, and went up on the mountain and sat down there. Jesus rewarded the faith of this Gentile woman. But he also stated that his ministry was to the Jewish people, not to the Gentiles. However, ultimately, while Jesus' ministry was to the Jews, they demanded signs while many of the Gentiles would accept him by faith. All right, verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, all of Galilee centered around the Sea of Galilee. The term sea, is, it's a bit of a misnomer, um, as it definitely would not qualify as a full-fledged sea. Uh, it's 13 miles long from north to south, and it's just 8 miles across from east to west. So then, it is quite small. And the Gentile believer, Luke, who had seen a lot of the world, he actually never calls it by the term sea. He always uses the term lake, kind of like how we have mountains here around Birmingham, but to someone from Colorado, we have hills, right? It is in the shape of an oval that is wider at the top than at the bottom, and it expands out on the north side from the Jordan River, which also exits on the south side and flows on down to the Dead Sea. Now, all of this lies in a tremendous rift valley, and the Sea of Galilee is 680 feet below sea level. Now, at this depth, it has a warm climate, and the countryside around it is very fertile. It is a very beautiful lake, especially when looked down on from the high country that surrounds it. Now, the population around this lake was huge, with no fewer than nine cities around its shore But by the 1930s, only Tiberias remained, and it had diminished to being only a small village. Now, today, Tiberias is a larger city and is continuing to grow. I've been and stayed in a hotel there twice, and I can tell you it is an absolutely beautiful place, and the people there are very, very friendly. Now, pertinent to our study, in the time of Jesus, the Sea of Galilee was filled with fishing boats. As for fishing, there were three methods of fishing. There was fishing by line, which, yeah, you know, I don't think I have to explain that. Uh, drag nets were used, that is, nets spread out between multiple boats and dragged through the water to trap fish. And then there was fishing by casting a net. The casting net was a, uh, it was circular, probably about nine feet across. Uh, it could be the ca- it could be cast into the water from from the land, or it could be cast from a boat, sinking down, and it, it would then trap whatever was within it. The ends would then come together as the net was pulled back in, bringing all the fish or whatever with it. And this was the kind of net that Peter and Andrew, as well as James and John, were using here. So in their text here, we have Jesus walking by the lakeside at Capernaum. And as he walked by, he calls Peter and Andrew and James and John. Now, as we know from the Gospel of John, this was not the first time that some of these guys had been called by Jesus. They had already talked with Jesus and had already listened to him. But in this moment, there came to, the, there came to them the challenge once and for all to, to, to throw in their lot with Jesus. Now, early in his ministry, after being baptized by John the Baptist, 
Jesus called Simon Peter and Andrew to be disciples. We know, from, we know this from the text of John chapter 1, which took place shortly after Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist. And there we read this. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. When you read through the rest of the text, you find out that, uh, that one of those disciples was Andrew, who, who went and found his brother Peter, and brought Peter to Jesus, who then called Peter Cephas. So, so what's going on here? Well, I look at it this way. The first call was to salvation. The second call was into ministry. Now, I could be wrong about that. It could be simply that they had, had second thoughts and, and they left Jesus and went back home to their jobs. And that would mean that Jesus had not given up on them and came to call them again. Nobody can say for sure why we find them here back fishing and Jesus then having to call them a second time. But I lean more towards the idea that first was to salvation and this time was to service. And if we look at what Jesus said to them, we see that call to service and to ministry. Follow follow me and I will make you fishers of men is what Jesus said. So what were they to do? They were to follow Jesus. What would Jesus do? He would make them fishers of men. Put simply, Jesus called them to make a commitment, and then he would do the work of making them fruitful. And the same applies to those who receive Jesus today. The the results are not up to you or I, except to the point that we make that commitment to Jesus. Now, some people do make a lot of hay on the characteristics of the people that Jesus chose. Certainly, fishermen had to have some degree of patience, but we can't say that all fishermen are always patient, can we? Peter, James, and John were certainly not consistently patient. There was that calling down fire from heaven to destroy a Samaritan village suggestion. Remember that in Luke chapter 9? Again, James and John wanted to, they wanted to destroy a a whole village because they would not allow Jesus to stay overnight there. Shall we call down fire from heaven to destroy them? Now, fishing does require perseverance. That is, the ability to, to persevere and not become so discouraged that you just throw it all away and quit. But given what the Gospels record, I have a hard time applying that to the disciples either. Now, certainly courage would be required as as the boats were not very big and the lake could grow somewhat violent in storms. But then I seem to remember the disciples in the boat in a storm and they were crying out in fear. There are more characteristics of a fisherman that might apply to these disciples, but you know I have a hard time finding many that consistently apply to them. They were patient sometimes, impatient plenty of times. In fact, Jesus had a nickname for the sons of Zebedee. Mark 3 says that Jesus gave them the name uh, Bonarges, Bonarges, meaning sons of thunder. They persevered. Sometimes, other times, they they were flat out ready to quit. They were courageous, sometimes. Other times, they were very fearful. They knew when to fish and when not to fish, but they didn't always have an eye for the right moment all the time. Now, others place... A lot of emphasis on these being uneducated men. And that may have been the case for some of them. However, remember that not all education comes in a classroom, a yeshiva, or a synagogue. Life experience, victories and failures, can create very well-educated and intelligent, unschooled men and women. And God gives each person skills and talents that are not gained always in a classroom. I think the greatest thing about these disciples was their willingness. And for some of them, it took Jesus calling them twice. So what I want you to take away from this 
is be willing to follow Jesus and don't pridefully assume you, your education, or your skill sets have anything to do with it. The disciples were common people of Israel. We know a few of them were fishermen. One of them was a tax collector. The others, we don't even know for sure what they did. But we do know that Jesus called them, and they eventually followed. Jesus did not ask them what their perfect dream destiny would be. He called them to follow, and they did. And the Lord did with them, as was his will. All right, verse 23. It reads this way, And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, and paralytics. And he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So Jesus chose to begin his ministry in Galilee. And in Galilee, Jesus chose to launch his campaign in the synagogues. The synagogue was the most important institution in the life of any Jewish individual. There was a difference between the synagogues and the temple. There was only one temple, the temple in Jerusalem. But even where there was the smallest collection of Jews, there was a synagogue. Larger villages and towns might have two. Cities might even have more than that. The temple existed solely for the offering of a sacrifice. There were synagogues in in Jerusalem associated with the temple. Sometimes rabbis and, and teachers would teach out in the courtyard. So the synagogue was essentially the institution for teaching, and new insights were welcomed. There were many synagogues around Galilee in the time of Jesus. In the archaeological park of Capernaum, there are remains of a synagogue that's dated to the 4th or 5th century AD. And under that synagogue, there are the ruins of a synagogue that dated to the time of Jesus. The synagogue service was constructed in such a way that new teachers had a chance to present their ideas. Now, each service had three parts. The first part consisted of prayers. The second part consisted of readings from the law and from the prophets. Members of the congregation took part in the readings. The third part was the message, and it wasn't expected to be the same person each time. The ruler of the synagogue presided over the service, but a distinguished visitor or a well-known teacher might be asked to speak by the ruler of the synagogue. So then Jesus, who's renown was growing, would have found opportunity to speak in the synagogues. And there he would find the most sincerely religious people, and he would have the opportunity to talk with them and answer questions after the message. Now, Jesus also healed the sick. So then reports of what he was doing went out, and people came in crowds to see him. People even came from Syria And these would have been Jews who were living abroad. The fact that Jesus started in synagogue meant he was first attracting Jews to hear his message. Preaching in the synagogues, if his ministry had been to the Gentiles, he would not have been doing that. He would not have been preaching in the synagogues. Now I want to conclude this morning with uh, an observation. In our chapter, we saw a handful of disciples who left their profession behind to follow Jesus. But not every disciple of Jesus is called to leave behind their profession. A great example of this is uh, what we'll see later with Joseph of Arimathea. He was a secret disciple of Jesus who retained his position in society along with his great wealth and offered an indispensable service to Jesus at the moment of greatest need that only he could offer. And as we'll see in Matthew 27, he very bravely went to Pilate petitioned for the body of Jesus, and then laid Jesus in his new tomb. Being a disciple of Christ means that we place as the priority of our lives the heralding of the message of our King, that is, the gospel. And it may not be that you have to change jobs to do that. 
being a testimony of the Lord can happen where you are. Christian school teachers can reach non-Christian school teachers, and though perhaps with some care, uh, students as well. Christian dentists often have a captive audience. Fisherman, janitor, pastor, doctor, retired, parent, friend, family member. Whatever your circumstance, God gives you open doors, opportunities to share the gospel that, that others may not have. We each have a privileged place of ministry that is unique to following Jesus in our daily lives. Even the disciples still continued in much of the circumstances Jesus found them in. For instance, Peter continued to live in his own home with his wife and his mother-in-law. It was likely the same for Andrew and for his family. We must not think that by continuing in the circumstance that we're in, when we receive Jesus is somehow not following Jesus. Paul even wrote in 1 Corinthians 7, Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. Like the original disciples, we can also be fishers of men in whatever happens to be our circumstance. Not all of our testimony is verbal. A large part is in how we live faithfully living out our circumstances as God has placed us. That is being good parents, being good employees and employers, exhibiting the fruits of the Spirit in our life situations. And that, of course, by faith, according to the grace of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Your name is holy in our hearts. And we pray that your name would be holy in all this world, to all people and to all nations. Lord, we pray for the leaders of this nation that you would be holy in their hearts. As a church body, we desire your kingdom. We, we desire to do your will. You have provided. We know that you will continue to provide according to our needs. And we thank you. As you love us, Lord, teach us to love one another as you have forgiven us of so much. Help us to forgive one another. Lord, help us to have our treasures in heaven rather than seeking after ourselves here on earth. We ask that you would establish us in all of your good things. And we ask that you would guard our hearts and keep our hands from evil and that you would protect us from the deceptions of our enemy, the devil. Lord, we thank you for trials even as we endure them and you graciously see us through them and grow us through them lord and we ask that you would be glorified through our trials and in our trials and lord we thank you for being our great high priest lord we place ourselves before you to do your will we ask that you would lead us in victory and use us to spread knowledge of jesus christ to the unsaved world may the lord bless you and keep you may he make his face and his light to shine upon you May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, that's Jesus the Messiah, our Lord and our Savior. And everyone said, Amen. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's message from the Bible. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that the end result of sin is judgment and condemnation. But God graciously provides the means to you to be forgiven. And to be saved. And that is by faith in Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sins, taking the punishment that you deserve. The Bible says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You receive the free gift of salvation in Christ by faith. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I've done terrible things in my life, but I know that I'm saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And no matter what you have done, you can be too. For the Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So please, don't put it off. Take this moment to confess Jesus. I'm closing chapters, looking backwards, and I'm making sense. I'm in
interested in all that flourishes from ignorance.